evening. My name is Al Place. I've been collecting radios for about 10, 12 years now. Uh, my background is repair technician in the past and engineer since then. Uh, I primarily like the technological aspect of the, uh, of the hobby. I collect short wave set communication receivers, etc. Let's start out by considering what, yeah, what is the most magic thing about a radio? Come on, what is it? Memories. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Like radios play. They suck voices and music right out of the air, sometimes from halfway around the planet. And it's important to me to hear a radio play to find out how it works when it was originally sold and originally used. Let's consider the other part of this, restoration. When you're dealing with a relatively young piece of electronic equipment, 10-year-old radio, thing stops playing. If you go in, you use signal tracing to find the bad stage. You do voltage measurements to find the bad component. You replace the component, and the set comes up and it's happily ever after. In most cases here, we're dealing with electronic instruments that are more than half a century old, and to really get them to play right requires measures different, basically different from, from your uh, troubleshooting and repair techniques. Talk about philosophy. This is my philosophy. Maybe you won't like it, but uh, this is pretty much it. Let's make the step work like it did when it was new. And let's make it stay fixed for a while. <clears throat> Probably on to the next century, I think we can do that. Uh, point here, sometimes when I start working on a radio, I say, gee, am I committing some sort of uh, faux pas here by tearing parts out of this thing, by making it somewhat different than the way it came out of the factory? Uh, my answer to that is most of the sets we're talking about here are not that rare. A radio that doesn't play is pretty uninteresting, and the Smithsonian guys will, will save some of them in their original condition that don't play. So how do we do this? In many cases, it's by doing a shotgun job of the thing, replacing a lot of parts without even worrying about whether they're really bad or not. Substitution with modern parts, we're talking here primarily about capacitors and to some, to some extent resistors. Uh, I like to not tear things up in, in terms of how they were wired, what kind of craftsmanship went into the set. I'll show you some techniques to achieve that. And I've come around to believe that modern components that are hidden below deck in a radio are perfectly acceptable, so I don't spend time pulling the insides out of the capacitors have to do the capacitors inside them. Now, the radios that we're primarily talking about here are ones of the golden era, let's say the, the 30s and 40s and 50s. And as opposed to early, earlier radio sets, we see some problems developing as the radios become more complex. Primarily, a greatly increased component count which drives the reliability down at an alarming rate. And it was the early state of the art that this thing like was built the concept of long-term reliability and a lot of things that weren't known about material science. So a lot of these components just weren't going to last half a decade. And a lot of this stuff you'll see dead, dried up electrolytic caps, leaky paper caps, resistors changing value, and other materials like some of the plastics uh, rubber insulation on wires and whatnot just coming apart completely. These are the problems we have to face. To look at that in another way, here's a typical battery set, <coughs> Atwater Kent Model 30. It's most it's transformer coupled from one end to the other. There's one high value resistor in here, the grid lead, and there are two things that you'd recognize as tubular capacitors here and here. This is about, what, 1928 or thereabouts? 
728. In 10 years, we progressed to radios that look like this. This is a 12 tube Zeta from 1938, the one I have to the Walmart's case. I've circled the gaps, circled in red, circled the resistors in blue. Any one of those parts would be out of tolerance enough to make the set not work right. And in many cases, the vast majority of them are in that condition. So going into the set, determining the back capacitor is short and replacing it, the set sort of plays a couple of days later, it goes dead further. It's, it's a waste of time and um, there's ways to solve the problem. I'm going to digress just a little bit, talk about the order that things happen in here. Visual inspection of the radio, which is probably the first thing you do when you get one. Hopefully you do it before you buy it so you don't find yourself in big trouble. Of course, some sets are so you fall in love with it, it doesn't matter. But you're looking for gross damage, <coughs> missing parts. Um, one of the bugaboos of communication receivers is the ones that have been modified to cause a lot of trouble. And what I call irreparable cosmetic problems, you have broken dial glass that has the, uh, has the, the, the dial scale screened on it or something. It's real difficult to deal with that stuff unless you know where there's parts. And there's the other half of visual inspection. After it's too late, it, you own it. But you look around looking for burn components, physically leaking capacitors. The one I just read is the broken band switch in a in an all-way set. Could be a real problem to fix up. <coughs> okay. Once I've decided to restore a set. First thing I pay attention to is the power transformer. It's probably the most, by today's price, is what you pay for replacements. It's probably the most expensive component in there. Don't just plug it in and turn it on. It's not unusual that you burn up the power transformer that way. But if you do, you, you find yourself in a lot of trouble. Uh, I'll show you here in another couple of slides a good way to check the transformer. I'd like to know I have a good transformer before I get real involved in restoring the set for the above mentioned reasons that you might be able to blind the alley. The other thing that I think is a good idea to preserve the transformer and the rest of the set is install a fuse. Very few of the radios in this era were fused. I think before the war it was almost unheard of. Uh, you can install one of the little clip-tight fuses, the little fake light bases you can buy at the radio shack inside the chassis somewhere, close to where the power cord comes in. There's always a problem with choosing a reasonable value for the fuse. Give you a little bit of a formula here. It's going to be on the order of an amp or two, maybe as little as half an amp in a small set. Uh, the message is don't put a 10 or 20 amp on a motor fuse, fuse clip, because it won't be really good. Both sides 